I arrived at the starboard bio drone chamber in time to seal the hatch to the airlock chamber behind Omu. I was able to monitor the happenings inside the airlock on a small wall-mounted view screen. The water rose filling the hatch. Omu opened the upper hatch and moved Jonathan's deployment cylinder up the ladder. A minute later, the black mobile unit descended the ladder and shut the upper hatch. Soon the water level began to drop. I found a large towel and waited with it for the airlock hatch to open. While I waited, I heard a noise coming from the port. Aquatic drone launched Joan. I am guiding it to Jonathan's cylinder to take it to the surface. The airlock hatch opened and I began to pat down the wet humanoid unit. We then paused to watch the view screen which showed Jonathan's cylinder surfacing and opening. Once the bird had taken flight, we got busy deploying the other bio drones and larger aquatic drones. It took us most of an hour to get the three remaining animals into the water in their heavy cylinders, along with the four aquatic drones needed to propel them. Jonathan's support drone and cylinder were also going, even though the cylinder would travel empty. After all the animals were gone and their drones launched, Omu began to prep the mini-sub while I went to use the head and don my diving suit. I returned back to the starboard airlock chamber and crawled into the mini-sub. Hold the fort down, Naomi, I yelled as I sealed the thick hatch behind me. I was alone in the mini-sub for the moment as Omu was going to assist outside as we attached the cargo and energy modules to the exterior of the mini-sub. I undocked and moved the mini-sub clear of Nautilus. The water was cloudy and I had to rely on the superimposed images of the larger sub which my short-range sonar produced. I also noticed there was a bit of a current as I maneuvered the small submersible around Nautilus to a location under the port sponson's moon pool. There I saw one of the two large cargo modules being lowered from the pool via a winch. Omu appeared after the module and helped position the module to one side of that mini-sub's hull. I had to smile as the little unit was wearing what looked like a life vest. It was a flotation vest and would help the heavy unit remain neutrally buoyant instead of sinking to the bottom. Once the module was lashed in place, the little unit pulled itself back up into the moon pool to lower the second module. The procedure was repeated and the mini-sub was ready for its trip with the two exterior cargo and energy modules attached. From the camera views of the exterior relayed by Omu, the mini-sub looked like it was carrying two large torpedoes alongside its central cylindrical hull. Omu moved to the front of the mini-sub and secured herself to the main grapple. The little unit would ride outside for the trip to the river's mouth. All set, Omu? I asked. Ready to proceed, Joan. Full speed ahead. We headed towards the river's mouth at around four knots and a few meters depth. I let the AI navigate us as it could react faster to the data provided by the short-range depth transducers. After half an hour, the ride got bumpy as we fought the twisting currents and flows of the river where its waters mixed with the ocean. I could see the bottom occasionally as we crossed sandbars. Another half hour of travel found us half a kilometer up the Kalani Ganga River. A sudden dark shape off to the port side revealed itself to be the remains of a large stone or concrete bridge support. We slowed and moved back downstream a few dozen meters and made our way towards the port bank of the river, a bit downstream of the location of the bridge. Our target was the mouth of an old canal which had once been north of the river just inland from where it had entered the ocean. I felt a thump and heard a mechanical whir as a small camera mass we had constructed for this excursion was extended up above the surface. An image of the surface appeared in my goggles display. The camera panned around and I saw the jungle covered riverbanks on each side of the 200 meter wide river. Towards the closer north bank, I spotted the inlet to a smaller river or canal. That must be our target and I watched as we approached its entry slowly. The depth readings quickly grew shallower as we entered the narrow tributary, but there was still enough depth to keep us submerged. The water was just murky enough that I could not see the bottom. The readings also indicated all kinds of debris in the canal bottom. Soon we slowed to a stop and I could just make out in the murky water ahead the four aquatic drones and their bio drone delivery cylinders hovering motionless side by side. They had made it to this rendezvous. I jumped when Otto swam around the front clear bubble of the mini-sub. The little bio drone was stretching its legs and tail and scouting the immediate canal area. Omu got busy and swam away, briefly interfacing with each aquatic drone and updating them with the latest data. 
I saw Otto return and enter its cylinder. Soon the drones slowly turned and left the canal, proceeding on their slow journey up the river to the target coordinates. This location was now fixed in each aquatic drone's inertial navigation systems as the home location to return to when their mission was completed. Joan, the surface is now free of satellite coverage for the next 78 minutes, Omu said. I brought the mini-sub closer to the western bank of the canal. The sub's keel scraped along the bottom, and I slowly brought it shallower until the surface of the water appeared right above the front hemispherical bubble. The upper hatch is 10 centimeters above the surface, Joan. I moved just a bit closer to the edge of the waterway and let the sub settle down to the bottom. I saw in the relayed view from Omu that the upper hatch was now just above the surface, while the main hull remained a dozen centimeters below. Perfect. I twisted around and stood, opening the upper hatch. I popped my head out and saw that I was still too far from the shore to jump, so I would be utilizing my wetsuit in wading or swimming. Ohamu approached and together we started retrieving waterproof bundles of gear from the still submerged cargo modules along each side of the mini-sub. I made a few trips back and forth to shore shuttling the gear. The canal bottom had a bit of muck, but it was firm enough to bear my weight without sinking or sticking. Once I had everything on shore, Omu joined me and started rummaging through the packs looking for something specific. What are you hunting for? I asked. The underwater detectors. I intend to establish a perimeter of at least 100 meters to provide warning if a large crocodile should approach. That made me perk up. I shivered a bit, thinking of the trips I had already made in murky water. For some reason, crocodiles had not been mentioned in the recent wildlife hazard reports. I looked around the jungle-covered shore where we stood. I suppose I had better also get the thermal cameras and motion sensors out so that we can monitor the shore. Yes, Joan. Please install them in a perimeter of at least 50 meters, Omu replied, as she and her armload of underwater sensors waded back into the canal. I found the thermal cameras and motion sensors and set about installing them in a wide circle around our campsite. The jungle here was mostly palm trees and other water-tolerant species. The area had been fully urban nine centuries ago, so the ground was a mix of organic matter interspersed with rubble and gravel from old paved areas or building remains. There were mounds and hills under the undergrowth, which must have been old buildings or other human construction, although you had to look hard to find signs of humanity. Other visible remains mostly consisted of glass bottles and other worn objects, or the occasional heavy plastic object which was weathered or eroded down to unrecognizable lumps. I had returned to the campsite near the canal shore, just as Jonathan glided in for a landing. Oumu approached the avian bio unit and slipped on the data link collar. I found a tablet and sat watching as Ohmu played video and still images of the nearby river in former city of Colombo. The first thing of note was a large pair of circular lakes located a few kilometers inland from the ocean to the south of here. Each was over a kilometer across. They must have been the remains of two impactors which had hit this area during the initial attacks. The lack of a distinct crater rim around each lake must be a sign that the area had both deeper bedrock and frequent heavy rains. Jonathan spent a bit of time overflying the old harbor area and industrial areas of the old town. A half dozen colored icons appeared as Omu designated active enemy AI controlled mobile units. There was a large structure which also had active units and was bristling with satellite dishes and tall pole antennae. At first I was nervous at how close the bird flew to the active mobile units and enemy structures, but I relaxed when I spotted many other birds in the air and on the water nearby. Joan, I have scanned the data of the full river overflight to the target area at high speed. I will review the data further before passing it back to Nautilus. But from my initial scan, it does not appear that the river will hamper the passage of either the aquatic drones or of the mini submersible. That was great news. I stowed the tablet back in its watertight bag and went back to work preparing our hidden campsite. I used my knife's sawtooth blade to cut down a few saplings and then draped them out over the water so their leaves hid the top of the mini-sub. Up and down the old canal edges, there were many other fallen trees, so I figured these new ones would not be noticed. Back into the heavy growth about 10 meters from the canal edge, I used my machete to clear a bit of undergrowth. I found and spread a heavy ground tarp on this cleared area and deployed my small tent. Omu came and helped me cover the area with camouflage netting. The plan was for us to camp here and await Jonathan as the bird continued to scout the river. 
Once the four aquatic drones reached the river's closest point to the target, the avian would rendezvous with them and begin to relay scouting data back to us at our hidden base. If the area proved safe, then Omu and I would break camp, depart in the mini-sub, and journey upstream ourselves. There, we would set up a new camp much closer to the target coordinates. Our estimate was that the drones would arrive at the river bend near the target sometime tomorrow morning. Jake would then run over and take the first look around the target and then return to the river. There, he would link up and transfer data to Jonathan, who would then fly the data back to us. George the monkey and Otto the otter would begin doing their own reconnaissance of the area in the meantime. Joan, a small aquatic drone from Nautilus, just signaled its arrival near the mini-sub. I will go link up with it and transfer data. It will then return and update Naomi. Do you have any messages for that presence? Omu asked, heading to the water's edge. No, nothing I can think of. Oh, tell her that we miss her. Omu actually paused a second to glance back at me before continuing on. I will relay those sentiments, Joan, she said, loud enough for me to hear. I sat in the camp area resting for a bit on a lightweight folding stool and watched the little black unit working near the water. It finished uploading the data to the aquatic drone and sent it on its way back to Nautilus. Omu then fed Jonathan its nutrient fluid. The seagull was going to get in one last survey flight of the immediate area before night fell. I began to think about my supper. Since we were so close to the active enemy units, we were going to skip the campfire. I did have a bundle of small fuel canisters for cooking that would provide enough smoke-free heat to boil water. So I set up a large container to heat. We had plenty of fresh water as there was a filtration unit aboard the mini-sub and Omu had strung a small hose to our camp. I looked it through the ration packs and settled on macaroni and cheese. Heck, I still enjoyed it, even though it had been one of the staples I had lived on while a recluse widower. I snorted. Hell, who was I kidding? I was still a recluse widower. Or was I a widow? I was a woman now, after all. I chuckled at the thought. After supper, I gave myself a sponge bath and went to bed early. Omu had recharged from a power conduit connected to the mini-sub and was now standing near the tent with the pistol weapon drawn. I had the short-barreled flechette gun near my pillow in the tent just in case. Jonathan was nesting immobile near my feet. I was awoken sometime around midnight by a flash of lightning followed by rolling thunder. It began to rain so I put on my goggles with the noise-canceling headband and then filtered eyepieces and did my best to go back to sleep. Morning came quickly like it always did when near the equator. I woke and checked what time it was on my data watch and also saw that it was Sunday, June 2nd. So much for sleeping in. Omu had heated water and made me coffee. While I sipped my morning cup of joe, the black humanoid unit made me scrambled eggs. For starting out dehydrated, they tasted pretty good, and I finished them quickly. Thank you for breakfast, Omu, I said, trying to remain polite. I have constructed a makeshift latrine a dozen meters to the west if you need, Joan. Remember to take your weapon and remain vigilant for reptiles. Nice. That thought sure hurried my morning constitutional along. The latrine was simply a seat on folding legs and a waterproof bag of toilet paper hung from a flushing shovel. While I took care of business, Omu got Jonathan airborne. It would spend an hour flying around locally before returning for a quick pit stop after which it would head off to the eastern target area. Hopefully, it would arrive there in the late morning, just in time to link up with Jake, who would be returning from his first trip to the target site. If so, we could expect Jonathan back here sometime in the early afternoon with Jake's data. I got dressed and went for a walk along the edge of the old canal. I was wearing the stealth suit, so I was not concerned about aerial or satellite surveillance. I spotted a great deal of animal life, including tree boas, various monkeys, and a few crocodiles in the water. There were also lots of birds flying around, and I quickly got used to them and stopped flinching whenever one would fly overhead. Luckily, I did not have to use the flechette gun. When I returned to the campsite, I saw Omu at the water's edge linked to the aquatic drone. I had just stripped out of the stealth suit and set it up to recharge when Omu returned to the camp. The humanoid unit was carrying mail. Yes, I had to look twice when I saw that it was carrying an honest-to-God letter. The aquatic drone brought this for you, Omu said as it handed me the letter. I was suspicious as I inspected the letter, wary of a prank. I smiled when I saw that the return address was Naomi, Vessel Nautilus, submerged somewhere. 
It was addressed to Joan Abrams, Camp Canal Side, Colombo, Sri Lanka. I laughed out loud when I saw the canceled stamp was an inverted Jenny, the 24 cent US postage airmail stamp with an upside down biplane. That had been one of the rarest of rare stamps with a value in the millions back when. I tore open the envelope. Inside was a flowery greeting card. Dear Joan and Omo, I hope all is well on your travels. Everything is fine here, although the nights are lonely. I look forward to your successful return. Take lots of pictures. I miss you both. XOXO Naomi. I read out loud. What a crazy machine. Did she send anything else? I asked. Just this, and Omu handed me a few packets of powdered beer. I laughed a hearty laugh. That afternoon, Jonathan returned around the time we expected, although its sudden landing in the camp clearing surprising me a bit. Omu began the data download procedure and I got out the tablet to view the first images. Soon I was watching the point of view video of a small animal running through the jungle. This was obviously data recorded by Jake. The video accelerated for a few minutes as the jackal made its way across the three kilometers from the river to the target area. It slowed to normal speed when Jake arrived near the target coordinates. The area was under a heavy tree canopy, but there were areas free of undergrowth. The view slowly panned across these areas. OMU had processed the data enough to add a colored icon over the exact location of the target coordinates. The location was a mound of earth or rubble with a few tree trunks growing out of it. Jake slowly circled the area, scanning both the area of the mound and the surrounding area. I noticed the mound was on a small hill, so it might not have flooded over the centuries. Nothing artificial was visible in this first quick survey. After a few minutes, the jackal moved closer to the mound and started sniffing around the base of the trees. There appeared to be something solid under the mound like stone or concrete. The location of this mound matches the target coordinates precisely, Joan. It also matches up with a small shrine or temple which appeared on the old data maps from your former era's internet maps. Jake nosed around the mound a bit longer and then turned to begin the journey back to the river. I noticed that it was taking a different route for the return which paralleled the first by a few hundred meters. The video sped up and after a few minutes, the jackal made it back to the river's edge in the waiting aquatic drones and transport cylinders. George became animated and placed a data collar on Jake. Data was transferred from the Jackal Biodrone and uploaded to both the Aquatic Drone and to Jonathan, who was standing on one of the cylinders. The point of view then shifted to Jonathan and I watched as the avian took off and began to fly west along the winding river. The video ended as the bird came in for a landing at this camp. I smiled as I saw my own surprised face look up as the bird flapped to a landing right next to where I had been standing. Omu spoke up. After Jonathan departed to return here, Jake will have consumed nourishment, and then George would have ridden him back to near the target coordinates. Otto had already departed the river site earlier and was swimming up the small tributary and will be at the target coordinates by now. I will transfer this information to the small aquatic drone, which will send it out to Naomi on Nautilus. We will await that AI's more detailed analysis before deciding whether to remain here or depart in the mini-sub. Since the aquatic drone's round trip would take at least five hours, I decided to get a nap in before having a late lunch. If everything went according to plan, we would depart late in the afternoon and travel all night up the river. I was unsure how much sleep I would get in the cramped mini-sub. Three o'clock the following morning found us more than halfway up the Kalani Ganga River. The river bend where the four aquatic drones and transport cylinders waited was less than 12 kilometers ahead. We were currently cruising along on the surface at three knots. I was standing in the open topside hatch, enjoying a bit of fresh air. 20 minutes of surface time remaining until we are again under the coverage of the orbital surveillance satellites, Joan. Thank you, Omu, I subvocalized. I was wearing my goggles with the night vision enabled. In the starlight, I could make out the snouts and eyes of crocodiles in the shallows as we navigated past. Some would stir as if to give chase when we moved by before quickly giving up the hunt. I had also discovered that the river had an abundant fish population as large catfish often came into view of the mini subs clear front dome. Omu had our downward focused underwater running lights on to aid her view of the waters ahead 
keeping an eye out for logs, boulders, or other hazards. I could detect the glow of the lights in the water occasionally, but it still remained below detectable limits. There had been numerous times when we had to come to a sudden stop in reverse course when a sunken bridge or other large object blocked our passage. Oh Mo, that large new orbital station has just risen above the horizon. Do you have any idea what it is for? I do not have enough data to derive a conclusive answer, Joan. The orbital construction could be a number of things. No data was sent to the planetside AI presences by the master AI about the matter before we were detached from agent. I am sorry. It sure was bright in my goggles. I wonder if we could construct a large telescope back on Nautilus to get more information about it. I mentioned the idea to Omu. The idea has merit, Joan. I will relay the request to Nautilus during our next data exchange. I stayed topside 10 more minutes before I closed and sealed the hatch. Twisting around, I was able to lay prone on the floor of the mini-sub. Omu was sitting close to the nose, navigating our forward progress up the river. I rolled onto my side and used a shrink-wrap bundle of clean clothing as a pillow. Soon, the electric motor sounds lulled me to sleep. I came awake a few times as the mini-sub lurched as Omu dodged a log or some other underwater object, but quickly fell back asleep. The bump of the mini-sub's keel settling down onto the river bottom woke me. I noticed the inside of the mini-sub was brighter. It must be daylight above. We have arrived at the River Ben Rendezvous, Joan, Omu said quietly. What time is it, Omu? I asked, rubbing my face and trying to twist around to sit up. It is 7.44, Joan. We are awaiting the passage of an overhead satellite before surfacing. Although the skies are likely to be mostly cloudy all day, our current location is a deep pool near the River Ben and closest to the target coordinates and the aquatic drones. When we surface, I will need your assistance in securing the mini-sub against the current," Omu answered. I fished around in the small waterproof bag of supplies and found my canteen. I also grabbed a chewy food ration bar and had a quick breakfast while we waited. Shortly after, Omu surfaced the mini-sub and I popped the hatch. The morning air was humid and warm and the skies were partly cloudy and clear. This part of Sri Lanka had an average temperature ranging from 26 degrees at night to 31 degrees at noon. I would be sweating and miserable. Omu left the mini-sub first and deployed a few proximity sensors in the water nearby the mini-sub. There was a cove on the southwest shore of the bend in the river where we were currently located, so I guided the sub as close to the shore as I could. I ended up grounding the mini-sub on a sandbar but Omu reminded me that this was okay, as we could leave a bunch of our gear here when we departed, thus making the sub light enough to float off the bar. We spent the next hour transferring some gear ashore and also anchoring the sub in place with four cables tied to large trees further on shore. It would have been a serious downer to have had the sub swept away by a flash flood caused by some upstream downpour. Because of the heat and humidity and the likelihood of rain and clouds all day, I was going to skip the stealth suit. Instead, I dressed in jungle shorts, a tank top, and a wide-brimmed hat. I had noticed when I put the tank top on I was getting hairy armpits. I ran my hand over my head and estimated that I had a good three centimeters of spiky hair now. My face was still smooth, so at least I would not be a bearded lady. Oh, Moo, will it bother you if I let my armpit hair grow out? I did not pack a razor. The little humanoid android did not hesitate a bit before answering. Absolutely not, Joan. I think it is sexy. Hmm, I'd have to say that was a tie. We had met up with Jake and Jonathan at the location of the aquatic drone cylinders. Omayu and I spent a bit of time anchoring them down with cable as their anchors had been slipping in the river current and they were wasting energy station keeping. Omu had attached a quick release device to all the cables so that the mini sub and the aquatic drones could depart quickly if needed. I then gathered supplies and a change of clothing in a pack and was ready to go. Omu data linked with Jonathan and the biodrone was sent on its way back to Nautilus to report our progress. The seagull would meet us at the target coordinates or later in the day when it returned. The time would be variable depending on the ocean surface conditions when the seagull arrived in the area. Nautilus would be floating a small buoy if the waves were calm enough. If not, the gull would return here without reporting in. It was after 10 o'clock when I began the three-kilometer hike from the river's edge to the target coordinates. Jake was in the lead and would trot ahead and pause while I hacked my way through the occasional dense undergrowth. 
Omu was behind me a dozen meters and had her weapon out at all times. Sri Lanka's king of the hill was the leopard. Omu was on guard to protect my backside from the big cat sneaking up and taking a bite out of my ass. I was more worried about stepping on a poisonous snake of some sort. I missed South Dakota and its lack of anything deadly or carnivorous. I took frequent breaks because of the heat and was glad we had spent a bit of time at the river filling extra water bags. My pack was heavy as I was carrying the extra water and an extra capacitor pack for Omu. Omu also had a pack with its own extra energy pack. This part of Sri Lanka had had a dense suburban population, and I ran across the ruins and remains of a great many old dwellings in the form of mounds of broken masonry and rubble. Much was covered with soil, leaf matter, and undergrowth, but more than once my machete was deflected by something of stone or rusted metal. A bit less than a kilometer from the target site, George met up with us. The little monkey was hopping from tree to tree and passed overhead on its way to Omu. I paused while Omu linked up with George and transferred data. After a minute, George took off and headed back in the direction we were heading. The target area remains clear of both enemy AI presences and biological threats, Joan. We resumed our hike. Jake spooked up a wild pig. The sow ran squealing away with two piglets following. I remembered Naomi's report on the hog DNA sample we had obtained on Rodriguez Island, which had confirmed that the species had been altered to prevent runaway population growth. From the small number of piglets in the fleeing sounder we had just spooked, I suspected this modification was worldwide. I wondered if all species were being altered to coexist in a more homogenous way. A hundred meters from our target, Otto showed up from the west. That way led to a shallow valley with a tiny tributary stream that meandered back towards the Kalani Ganga, near where our landing had taken place. The river otter was patrolling and scouting that wetland area while George and Jake focused on the eastern side of the route. George showed up again and guided us to the target spot. Finally, after over two centuries or a few months, depending on how you looked at it, we were here. I looked around the area and felt unimpressed. I had not known what I would find here, but this was on the extreme bottom end of my expectations. Instead of an armored bunker doorway leading to a huge underground cavern filled with weapons to kill the enemy AI I found. Just more jungle. Even the location was plain with no mountains or any clear reason why this location had been selected for the target coordinates. Were they incorrect or just a ruse? I guess we would have to investigate to find out. I concur with the Biodrone's sensors that there are no local electronic emissions in the area, Joan. I am also not detecting any large magnetic signatures. Background radiation levels are a bit higher, but not high enough to cause any health issues for you, Omu said. Omu then verified that the mound with the three small trees was located on the exact coordinates of 06 x 80.04864 the mobile unit had used its inertial navigation system to verify the location after Naomi had augmented it a month ago. That presence had built up many reference points on our journey here from Kings Bay. Both geographic reference points recorded from points along our trip and adjusted for continental drift over nine centuries were combined with current satellite locational reference data stolen from the enemy AIO's data net to set Omu's point of reference. We figured we would be within three meters of the target coordinates the numbers themselves were given in one hundred thousandths of a degree of accuracy, which equated to just a bit more than a meter. This meant we had a circular area of probability four meters in diameter to search. I guess this was the spot.